hopefully, I know we're getting started a little bit late today, but hopefully we'll have time to go over maybe a, a homework problem. So the test only covers up through two Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started here. So uh, again, want to remind you, exam next Thursday, we'll review on Tuesday. Uh, and again, the things to be looking at. Okay, guys, can you calm down for just one? Because this is important stuff. You guys want to listen to this. Um, exam uh, questions will be things like statements of theorems, definitions, and then you have a few easier proofs to, to do. But nothing that's going to be unreasonable or anything too messy. Okay, it'll be along the level of you know things you've done in the homework, but not the hardest stuff. Okay, so they, they should be things that will more or less work themselves out if you kind of know what you're doing. Okay. Pascal's rule. You should know what that is. Yeah. You should definitely know that. No, no, you don't need to know the proof. The theorems that I've done, uh, you don't need to know the proofs of, of the theorems that I've done in class. But you should know the statements of them. Okay. And we'll talk more about that on Tuesday, too. Can you give us some sort of review sheet? Um, Just a review that we're doing in class. Yeah, I'm not going to give you any specific sheet, but I will definitely tell you the kinds of things that you should be looking at. Okay, so there's not going to be any big surprises on the exam. Okay. Okay. So, uh, where were we? Okay, so we were trying to prove, okay. Uh, theorem, I, th I think it was theorem two, if I remember right. Okay. Yeah, so, this, you already have this in your notes. A and B are integers, not both zero. There is a unique, I'm going to use a little shorthand here because you already have this from last time, a unique natural number D, right, uh, such that. Okay, and I may be labeling this slightly different than I did differently than I did um, on Tuesday. But first condition is that D divides A and D divides B, right? Second condition is um, whenever C divides A. And C divides B, also C divides or is a factor of D. And then I think I said parenthetically, thus um, C is less than or equal to D. I believe I said that, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. And then there's a third condition. Um, Okay, well, maybe I didn't label this three, but it, it's part of what I said. Um, D is equal to X A plus Y B for some integers X and Y. Right? I did say this, I'm sure, right? Some, maybe I didn't label it as three, but this was there. This was there, right? <coughs> Can somebody say yes? I stated this. I, you didn't have that at all? Um, are you sure? It's it's okay. So I'm just making it explicit here, but yeah. Um, so what we did, I'm, of course, I'm not going to go and do this again. But um, the uh, continuation of the proof Okay, so what did we do last time? So we constructed the set S. Uh, I showed that it was non-empty, then it had a least element, and we chose our D to be an element of that set. And so we've already, if you were following on Tuesday, we've already established three, right? We chose D to be an, a member of the set, which was the set of all integer linear combinations of A and B. So we already know that three holds from, from what we did on Tuesday. And I also showed you that D was a factor of A, and then I said similarly D is a factor of B. So, so we've got one and three down already. Okay, so we just have to establish 
the second condition, and then we're going to establish uniqueness after that. Okay. Okay, so that's, this is, as I said, the last thing we have to do is to check the second condition. So let's, and this is actually not that hard, so let's suppose that um, C is an integer and C divides A and C divides B. Okay, so we will show that C divides D. So what do we know? Okay, I'm going to try to go a little bit more quickly here so I can get through everything today. So C is a factor of A, so that means that um, C times, say, alpha equals A. And since C is a factor of B, we know that C times beta equals B for some integers alpha and beta, right? Okay, and so we're almost done. Okay, is everybody with me so far? We're assuming C is the factor of A and C is the factor of B. So by definition, that just means C times some integer is A and C times some other integer is equal to B. And so all we have to do is just see that, um, let me just write it here. D is equal to, by this third condition, which we've already checked, right? XA plus YB, right? It's just from up here, which we already got. And so let's just substitute this in now. So now this is x times c alpha plus y times c beta. Okay, and just for clarity here, here's one, here's two. By one and two. Okay, does that make sense? Just substituting in. So what is it we're trying to prove? Um, we want to show that C is a factor of D. You can see how we, do that, how we can do that now, right? We want to show that C times an integer is D. That's what it means to be a factor. We can just pull out a C here, and what we have left is an integer, so C is a factor of D. Okay, so, oops. So thus, C is a factor of D. Okay, so there's one other thing. This parenthetical comment here, I, I would like to prove that as well. Um, so why does that imply that C is less than or equal to D? So um, all I'm going to say is, let's see if you guys buy this. Do you believe that C is less than or equal to the absolute value of C, right? Okay, now this is less than or equal to the absolute value of D, and I'll tell you why that's true, because of theorem 1 part F. This is in your notes. If a number divides some non-zero number, then that first number in absolute value is less than or equal to that second number in absolute value. This is theorem 1 part F. So let me just write that down. This is by theorem 1 part f. All right. So what's the assumption though for part f? If a divides b and b is not 0, well, we know that, okay, we've got c's, we just proved that um, c divided d 
We know that D is not zero because it was chosen to be an element of S, which was a set of natural numbers. D is not zero, right? Of course, D and N, right? That means it's positive. So we know D is not zero. And so what's the last thing we need to do to show that C is less than or equal to D? Well, very simple. Absolute value of D is equal to D because D is positive. These positive? Yeah. Now this book, does it include or exclude zero natural numbers? Oh, it excludes it. Excludes it, yes, definitely. So if you kind of just put this chain together going from left to right, then you've got C is less than or equal to D, which is what we wanted. Okay? All right. So um, as far as the uniqueness part is concerned, uh, I'll just do this kind of quickly here. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write a lot here because I'm not, I'm not really that concerned about the uniqueness part, but let me just say it really briefly. Let's suppose that um, D1 and D2 satisfy um, one through three. Okay, so we'll show. I will show you that um, they're the same. Okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time writing all this stuff out, but I'm just going to say a couple of these things in words. Okay, D1 and D2 satisfy these conditions. So notice then that D1 divides A, D1 divides B. And whenever some integer divides both A and B, then it has to divide D1. Okay, well, I'm going to say it first, and then I'll write it down. D2 satisfies 1 as well. So D2 divides A and B. So D2 has to divide D1. And then you can reverse, you can sort of transpose that argument to get that D1 divides D2. So D1 is less than or equal to D2 by this parenthetical comment, and D2 is less than or equal to D1. They have to be the same. Okay. So this is all I'm going to say then since... Let's see if I can get this over here. Since D1 divides A and D1 divides B, also D1 divides D2. And this is just by the second condition. Well, really, this is by 1 and 2, but just applied to. One's applied to D1, one's applied to D2. So D1 is less than or equal to D2. OK? Remember, D1 and D2 both, we're assuming they both satisf satisfy all three conditions. OK? D1 divides A and D1 divides B. And the second condition says, since it also holds for D2, that since D1 divides A and D1 divides B, D1 divides D2. That's where I'm getting this in conclusion. And then you can just flip the role of D1 and D2 to get uh, that D2 is also less than or equal to D1. And if you know that one number is less than another and that number is less than the first, they have to be equal. <clears throat> okay, so therefore... D2 is less than or equal to, to D1, and, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, this I just barely squeezed that in here. Hopefully you can all see this. So D1 equals D2, and that shows that they're, those two numbers are unique. <coughs> all right. Any 
Can you guys all, can you see this? Okay. Um, anybody need more time writing this down? Okay. So, this uh, brings us then to our next definition. Now that we went through all that work, you're going to be happy to know now that um, everything else we're going to prove here, the proofs are going to be very short, comparatively speaking. And this is the last part of the section. A and B are integers, which are not both zero. Then this unique um, integer D that we just established from theorem two is called the greatest common divisor. Ah, oh well. Okay. Oh, God. Sorry. greatest common divisor of A and B. And it's denoted just GCD and then left parenthesis A comma B right parenthesis. Okay, so for example, and this is just, of course you, you probably don't need me to do this, but uh, I'm going to do it anyways just to make sure that everybody's aware that this is exactly the same thing that you've already learned a long time ago. The GCD of 2 and 4 is equal to 2. Okay, let me ask you this. What's the GCD of minus 10 and minus 15? What's that? I'm hearing a lot of muffled. Okay, that's just, yeah. It's positive five. Definition of GCD is that it's a pos it's a natural number. It's positive. Okay, don't forget that. That's that's why I gave you this example. It's always positive. If we don't define that it that it'd be positive, then the GCD is not uniquely determined. Okay, so we we don't want to say it's five or minus five. I and mean, there's a sense in which you could have chosen that too, but. Um, we want to make it unique so that we know exactly what we're talking about. So this, this is equal to 5. Okay. So it's always positive, remember that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, uh, I'm going to, just because I want to get through all of this, there's, there's a corollary in the book that I'm going to skip. Um, no, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to skip it, but I'm just not going to write out the proof of it. Okay, you excited about that? Okay. Um, and it just says this. Basically, it just says that every linear combination of A and B is a multiple of the GCD of A and B. So suppose that A and B are integers... which are not both zero. And what we're going to, let me just go over here. It's capital T.
Okay, so T is just this set. This should look familiar to you because we used this set when we were establishing the existence of D, right? Then this set T is precisely the set of multiples of the GCD. Oops, that's too many humps there, sorry. And this more or less follows from the previous theorem. So I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about this, really. It, the ideas are already there in what I did before, and the book proves this, too. It's, it's actually not that hard. So um, what we're going to do now, I think, hopefully, um, you'll find this to be a little bit more interesting. Um, we're going to talk about something, this condition uh, called being relatively prime. This is something that we'll definitely be studying a decent amount in here. You've all heard of prime numbers before, I'm sure. Um, it's not exactly what we're going to talk about yet. Uh, yeah, we'll probably get to that later at some point. You love to make fun of my writing. I'm just better. Well, I don't know that that's going to happen, honestly. Um, I'm very interested to see what your fee is going to look like. Oh, I, okay. I think the fee is going to look okay. Um, well, that remains to be seen. Well, before we introduce that, I'll have had time to practice, so hopefully it'll be better. No, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so uh, there's, before I before I finish this definition, I want to ask you a question. Okay, if, if you notice, uh, when we defined the GCD, I was always writing A and B are not both zero. They're not both zero. Why am I writing that? Well, what if they were both zero? Well, every number divides zero. So there is no, G, there is no greatest common divisor because everything divides it. That's why we need to impose that condition. Okay? I should have mentioned that before, maybe. But, um, That's not well, whenever you're talking, okay, so whenever you see GCD, if you ever see that in the homework and the book does, isn't explicit about it, you always assume that A and B aren't both zero. Like One of them might be. Room? What's that? Is it like an yeah, I mean, it's just sort of a yes. I mean, yeah, it's sort of built, built into the definition, and I may not always write that either, okay. but it's always assumed that A and B aren't both zero. Yeah. A and B are said to be relatively prime. Certainly, that doesn't imply that A or or B has to be prime itself. This, so when you when you hear when you see the word prime, don't immediately assume that that a prime number is going to come into this definition because that's not the case. <clears throat> if and it's actually a very simple definition. If the GCD is equal to one, okay. So let's just do a quick example of this. So, <laughs> um, how about we do this? And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm doing this for a reason. There's something I want to be very clear about here. And you're going to say, well, of course I know that. It's in the definition. But uh, you're used, to, most of you are, are used to the concept of, you've seen this concept of a prime number. You've seen that defined. You can all point out what the primes are. Relatively prime modifies two integers, not one. Okay, So you say that 7 is prime, but it doesn't make sense to say that 11 is relatively prime. That doesn't make any sense. Two integers, you say, are relatively prime always modifies two integers, not one. So be really careful that you kind of get that down. So why did I choose 10 and 21? Well, 
10 and 21 are certainly not prime, right? Neither of them is a prime number. They're relatively prime because they don't share any factors in common except for 1 and minus 1. Those are the only integers that divide both of them at the same time. Okay? So think of, kind of intuitively, think of two integers being relatively prime if they, if they don't share any common factors. Okay? Except for the trivial ones. Right? Okay. So does this example make sense? Okay. So I don't think I'm going to do another one. Um, well, I, yeah, no, I, I'm not going to. But um, so there's a really nice, and this is actually very useful um, as well. So this theorem, and it's also very easy to prove, fortunately, given what we already know. Theorem three. Okay, and I'm just for the sake of time, I'm going to suppress writing out. A and B are integers that aren't both zero. When you see A and B, uh, it, it's assumed that they're integers and they're not both zero. Okay. Yeah, I, I will. Yeah. So integers A and B, which are not both zero, <laughs> are relatively prime if and only if. Um, there are integers, again, I'm, I'm sorry for being a little sloppy here, here. There are x and y in z, in other words, integers x and y, such that, sorry, and I'll put an asterisk around this, such that xa plus yb equals one. Okay. So this is a necessary and sufficient condition for two integers to be relatively prime. There's some linear combination of them that gives you one. Okay. So if you notice, by the way, just if you look over here, you can see if you, this isn't too hard to establish, right? That you can find a linear combination of 10 and 21 that gives you one, right? Minus two times 10 plus one times 21 gives you one. Okay, and you can always do that for any integers that are relatively prime. Okay, I was going to use the bar here. I'm sorry, I didn't do that. Um, okay, does everybody have this? Are we okay? Okay, and now, like I said, the, the proofs that I'm going to do now are going to be very short and very direct, and they're not, they're not going to be long. Um, and actually, in the homework, you're going to have a couple of proofs to do. I really would encourage you, I always say this, but to try to follow along and understand the proofs because there are a couple of homework problems where you're going to have to sort of think this way. Okay. Okay, so again, there are sort of if and only if uh, statements, direct proofs, or proceed in sort of two steps. Um, we're going to, I'm going to suppress the arrow that I gave last time, but um, the first part is we're going to su suppose that A and B are relatively prime, right? There's not much to say here, really, but um, what does that mean? So by definition, that just means that the GCD of A and B equals 1. Right? That's what it means to be relatively prime. And I labeled these statements 1, 2, and 3. This is in your notes now. I'm not going to go back to it. But um, so, if you, so theorem 2, this is from today, theorem 2, part 3, says that the GCD is a linear combination of the, of the two numbers. Right? This, is, this, is the, this was there a couple of slides ago. So that means that we know that xa plus yb equals 1 for some x and y. That's just the third part of the theorem. You guys understand what I'm saying here? Okay. And that's all there is to the first part. Okay. 
It's just we sort of just get it for free by the theorem. Okay. Uh, and then the second part of this. Let's suppose that xA plus yB equals 1 for some integers x and y. Okay. What is it that we want to prove? We want to prove that, it, that uh, a and b are, in fact, relatively prime. That if some linear combination gives you 1, that, that they don't have any common factors other than plus or minus 1. Yes. Okay. Um, and maybe maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead here. But mm -hmm. You're basically when you write that that x a plus y b or however mm -hmm. you wrote it, mm -hmm. you're basically saying that the GCD is one. That's what you're saying. Right no, 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 because just knowing that a linear combination is equal to a, of two integers is equal to a certain number does not mean that that number is a GCD right away. For example, 2 times 5 plus 1 times 10 is 20. That doesn't mean that 20 is the GCD of 5 and 10. That was my question, is if, is if that is in fact what you're saying. No, but I'm saying if it happens to be 1, then that does happen to be the GCD. Okay, so there's something special about 1 that, that forces it to be the GCD. But in general, just because you know a number is a linear combination of two numbers, that doesn't mean that that number has to be the GCD. But because it's 1, it forces it on you. And that's kind of the point of this theorem. Okay. So here's all we're going to do. So we're going to let D be the GCD of A and B, right? So what do we know? There, there are a couple of things that we know about D. We know by definition of it being the greatest common divisor that it is in fact a divisor of A and a divisor of B, right? That's just by definition. So we know that say D alpha equals A and D times beta equals B for some alpha and beta in Z, right? Okay, so here I'm going to go back up here. Let me, uh, let me put an asterisk here next to this equation that we've got. xA plus yB equals 1. So by this starred equation, x times d alpha plus y times d beta equals 1. You guys see what I did here? We already have that equation, xa plus yb equals 1. And we know by definition of d being the GCD of a and b that d is a factor of a and d is a factor of b. So I'm just replacing a and b in that equation with d alpha and d beta. OK? So. What if we pull out a D here? We get D times X alpha plus Y beta equals 1. Okay? You guys buy that? It's not too bad. And so let me just make this a comma here. And what's the conclusion? Well, D then is a factor of, or D divides, 1, right? And if we go back. And this is partly why I did this theorem 1, all these sort of simple things. This is B, I'll write this down in a second, but this is B of theorem 1. If an integer divides 1, that integer has to be plus or minus 1. Since D divides 1, D has to be plus or minus 1. It, why is it not minus 1? By definition of GCD, it's positive. So the only possibility left is that D is equal to 1. Okay. By B of theorem 1, we know that D equals plus or minus 1. Since, by definition, D is bigger than 0, we get D equals 1. And that's exactly what we wanted to show, is that the GCD was 1. OK, so there, and this is very useful. You'll see how this is applied um, to get some, some results that are not 
obvious, or you might guess that they're true, but they're not, it's not obvious how you would possibly prove that they're true. This fact is very useful in elementary number theory, and um, you'll see an example here in a second. Okay, so um, where else do we want to go here? Okay, well, luckily we don't have a whole lot left, and then I can spend, hopefully, I'll get you started on a couple homework problems before the end of the class today. All right, so here's a corollary. Okay, I think I already gave you a corollary one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, okay, corollary two. This shouldn't be that, that surprising. Um, if the GCD of A and B equals D, so D is the biggest uh, common divisor of A and B, then the GCD of A over D and B over D, what do you think this should be? One, right? If we divide through by the greatest common divisor, there shouldn't be anything left that will divide them both, right? Except for one. If there was, then we, it wouldn't have been the greatest common divisor. It would be something bigger. Okay, and this is very short. Okay. So I want you to think through this. This, this is not going to take long at all. Okay, so there, there are several things that we learned in Theorem 2, several conditions that this uh, greatest common divisor uh, has. The third condition is that, and this is very important, don't forget this. You know, you learned a long time ago that the greatest common divisor is essentially the greatest integer that, that's a factor of A and B. What you probably didn't learn is that it's a linear combination of A and B. That, that's something that most people, that, that's not something you hear in, in fifth grade usually. Um, but that's huge for us now. This, this, this makes a, a big difference. This helps us to prove a lot of things that we otherwise wouldn't know how to prove. So if the GCD of A and B is equal to D, then by three of theorem two, three from today of theorem two, D is equal to XA plus YB for some integers X and Y, right? I'll just put this parenthetically, right? This is three of theorem two. Okay. We want to see if you can see how to, how to proceed from here. We want to show that the GCD of A over D and B over D is one. And so um, in order to prove that by the previous result, all we have to do is show that some linear combination of it is equal to one, right? previous theorem says that then the GCD is one. We just proved that. So how can we get a linear combination of A over D and B over D to be one? You see this? All we have to do is divide everything through by D and we're done. That's it. Okay, so again, um, I'll put a little asterisk underneath this. And then we get 1 is equal to x times this a over d, this is one way to write it, plus y times b over d, right? That's what we get if we divide everything through by d. Okay. So we're now this is it. Now we're done by, what was it, uh, theorem 3? Was that the last result, the numbering, theorem 3? Yes, maybe. That was the last, I, well, I could go up if I wanted, I guess. I'll stop being lazy. Yeah, okay, <laughs> theorem 3. Okay, you see that? Theorem 3 says as long as some linear combination is 1, 
then they're relatively prime. And conversely. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question. And there's just two more results that we're going to do, and then we're, and these proofs are very short, and then we're, we'll be done. Question one. Suppose we know that um, A is a factor of C and B is a factor of C. Um, the question is, must A times B be a factor of C? This is just something for you to think about for a second before I go into the next result. Okay, so in other words, we know some number divides C and some other number divides C. Does the product of those two numbers necessarily have to be a factor of C? What do you think? Anybody want to hazard a guess here? Not without right. Yes. Yes. You got your book open. But uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Can, you, can anybody give me a counterexample? Can anybody give me an example where uh, A divides C and B divides C, but the product doesn't divide C? Can anybody think of something where this uh, doesn't hold? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, All right, so what, he, what he's saying is, um, if I heard you right, 6 divides 24, right, and 12 divides 24, but the product is 72, that's too big, and it doesn't divide 24, right, so, yeah, so that's a, that is a perfectly good example. Yeah, Joe. Mm -hmm. if, um, and I don't have my book open. So. Uh, right. Um, if you can guarantee that um, the two numbers, the eight times two or whatever, if you can guarantee that that product is less than what you're dividing, then it works. Okay, so what we're going to. Um, or at least I think. Um, okay, so what is true is that, um, yeah, so if your product is smaller than yes, yeah, it should work, although we're going to go in a different direction here. Um, so um, let's see, so let's see, what do I want to say here? Um, Yeah, so there's a condition though that guarantees that the um, the product will, will divide it, and it actually has to do with being relatively prime. So if you know that, so if you notice this example, six and twelve, they're not relatively prime, right? Six is a GCD; it's not one. So if the GCD happens to be one, then that will guarantee that the product actually divides. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So, and, so, sorry, what I said before is not right. So, for example, 4 divides 12 and 2 divides 12. The product is 8, but that does not divide 12. So the fact that the product is less than or equal to does not, doesn't apply it. Yeah, I thought I had that wrong. But, yeah, so that's not good enough, actually. The, the relatively prime condition, you really need something a little stronger than that. Okay. Um, so, it just says this. Yeah, sorry for misspeaking before. So suppose that um, A divides C and B divides C, and um, this is just shorter than actually writing everything out. The GCD of A and B is equal to 1. In other words, A and B are relatively prime. Then AB divides C. Okay, 
I'm only going to torture you with after this with one more proof. Um, so let's see how this goes. This actually, once we have some of these these theorems, we're starting to get some tools, some machinery. Proving these things is actually not that hard, really. Um, so let's assume that. Um, Let's see, um, sorry, let's assume that alpha A equals C and beta B equals C and that the GCD of, I'm just trying to minimize my writing here to save time for homework, GCD of A and B is equal to 1. Here um, alpha and beta are integers or some integers. So, what else do we know? Um, the GCD of A and B is 1. That means that some linear combination of A and B is equal to 1. Right? That again just goes back to theorem 2, the last part of theorem 2. So we also know that XA plus YB equals 1. For some integers x and y. Okay, so let me give you an idea about how you might proceed with this. We need to show that AB is a factor of C. Okay, that's what we need to prove. Well, we have this equation over here. What is it we're trying to show? We're trying to prove that AB times something is equal to C. So we've got three pieces of information, right? We've got this, we've got the uh, second equation here, and then we've got the asterisk equation. Any idea? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this equation right here. There's something that we're going to do Notice that what we have to assume, both of these equations involve C. Okay, so we're going to want to use those somehow. Any idea what we might be able to do with this in order to be able to get A, a B times something equals C? There's just one thing we can do to both sides, and then if we use 1 and 2, it's going to, pull, it's going to come out right away. Multiply by C, exactly. And once you do that and you substitute, done. It's really not that bad. So we're going to multiply this start equation by C. And once we do that, um, let me just put two stars here, two asterisks here. We're going to get XAC plus YBC equals C. Right? Everyone okay with this? I don't, that wasn't too hard. I just multiplied through by C. And I want, to, I want you to, to see how we can get things to work out here. We want to get A times B times something to BC. So what we'd really like to do is this. We'd really like to have an A and a B here and an A and a B here because if we do that, we can pull it out. And then we'll have A, B times something is C. And that's what we want to prove, right? So the question is which of these two, we, we actually, there's, there's a correct choice and, a, and an incorrect choice really to use here. We want an A and a B to pop out here. So we want to replace the C here with one of these two things. Do we want to use the first one or the second one? The second one, because that's the one with the B in it, you see? And then here we want to use the first one to replace the C with alpha A because this one needs the A. Then we'll have an A and a B in both and we can pull it out. Okay? Good. All right. So. So by 1 and 2, this equation becomes xA times beta B plus yB times alpha A equals C. Okay, 
So everybody see what I did here? Is this okay? Pull out the AB and then we get AB divide C. And we're done. So pulling out the A and the B, AB times the quantity X beta plus Y alpha equals C. Since AB times some integer is C, by definition, AB divides C. Okay, and the last thing that we'll do, and again, for the sake of time here, what I may do, because the, the idea is very, very similar, um, I'm going to state this because this is very important. You actually use this in your homework. I'm going to state what's called Euclid's Dilemma. I'm not going to prove it. Um, it's in the book, and it's very similar to this. In fact, if you understood this, I think most of you could prove it yourselves without me even doing it. Um, so let me just do that. I'll state Euclid's, excuse me, Euclid's Dilemma, and then we'll talk about a couple of homework problems. Okay? All right. This we'll probably use quite a bit throughout the semester. If A divides BC and um, the GCD of A and B is 1, in other words, A and B are relatively prime, then A divides C. And you do the same kind of thing. You assume A divides BC, so AX equals BC, and you've got some linear combination of A and B that's equal to 1, and then you just multiply through it. The proof is very, very similar to what we just did. Okay. So the same... Um, I, sh I should have maybe asked the question before. I, I don't want to be very clear about this, too. I'm just going to say it now because I think you can follow it just with me saying it. Um, well, what if we don't have the, that uh, A and B are relatively prime? Is this still true? If A divides B, C, um, then does A divide C? Well, no, right? No. B well, yeah, I mean, so for example, 6 certainly is a factor of 2 times 3, but 6 is not a factor of 3, right? So it definitely doesn't work in general. And so you can't just do away with this hypothesis. You actually need it, okay? Okay, so how about we talk about a little homework, okay? How's that? In fact, I'm feeling kind of generous today. It's a nice, happy day. It's Valentine's Day. So my Valentine's Day gift to you will be... No, 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 no. Um, not that. Um, <laughs> no, what I'm what I'm going to do is um, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not yeah, I've gotten through 14 of them already. I only have three more to go. Yeah, I, know. I watched cartoons this morning with one of them, but I don't know if that counts as a date or not. But um, just kidding, I didn't really do that. Um, okay, you, everyone got uh, got this down now. Are we okay with this? Okay. So why don't I do? Uh, I will get you started on the homework by doing one of your homework problems for you, okay? And, um, and of course, since this isn't due until next Thursday, um, we'll also have time on Tuesday to talk about some more of these. And so I, I want to, there, there are a few, and maybe you realize this in the last homework too, um, that, you know, some of these are a little bit tricky, or at least you have to kind of see a, a, a trick to do some of these. But for... B. Okay, so yeah, you. I know you. You've already asked about this. That I'm just gonna go ahead and and talk about. What? Well, yeah, you weren't. You weren't gonna go any further. I know. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. Um, <laughs> hey, but that's good. That's good for you, though. It's good for you. Um, prove that. 
15 divides 2 to the 4n. Did you, uh, did you look at it after I gave you that hint? I, yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. Okay, okay. But see, now you have the satisfaction. Everybody else here is just going to go, oh. And see, now you can actually appreciate this. So you're better off. That's my point. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what does it say? For, for all n bigger than or equal to 1 by induction. Okay. All right, so probably we'll not end up grading this problem. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> hey, well, at least, hey, at least, um, you know, uh, if you had no idea what you were doing and you did left it blank, now you'll have something to say, and so at least you won't get dot completion points for this. Uh, you could, you could, you could, you could do that. And, well, but also this is going to, let's, let's see. So what else, what else did I give you? The main thought is, by having you help us show this, it's going to say, oh, look, here are the kind of tricks you're going to do. Yeah, exactly. Yes, thank you. Okay, at least one person appreciates me. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to do the base case. You guys upset me now. I'm not. Um, just kidding. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. I'm going to do the whole thing. Okay. So let's let's just go back through the the, the steps. We're, and this is this is the first principle. We don't need strong induction for this. Okay. Okay. So um, again, we're going to sort of split this up into two pieces. So the base case of the induction. We just have to. check, and there's not usually a lot to write here, a lot of you are writing more than you need to, that, well, we just need to see that this holds for n equals 1, right? So we need to, to check that 15 divides, or is a factor of, 2 to the 4 times 1 minus 1, right? And so all I'm going to say here is that this is clear since, well, what is 2 to the 4 times 1? minus 1 is 15, right? And that's really all you have to say. I mean, if you want to go ahead and say 15 times 1 equals 15, then that's fine. Um, but I know, I trust that you know that a number divides itself. Of course, it's a, a theorem, but you, you all know that, of course. So this is fine. This is okay. Okay, so inductive step. Okay, and I'm writing it out this way just because I, I want to, there was a little confusion about terminology in, in, uh, in the first assignment. So I want to make sure that everybody's aware of, of what this, this means. Some, some people were calling the, the base case the inductive step and vice versa. So, so what, do you, what do we do now? So we assume for some natural number n, that, and I'll put, um, put an asterisk here, 15 divides 2 to the 4n minus 1. That's the inductive hypothesis. Okay, and so we will show, or we must show, that 15 divides 2 to the 4 times, instead of 4n, it's 4 times n plus 1 minus 1. Right? That's what we have to show. Okay. Everyone clear with, on this part? So what is this really saying? This just means we need to show that this expression here is 15 times some integer. That's what we need to show. And we have assumed that 15 times some integer is, four, is sorry, 2 to the 4n. Minus one. Okay, so by our inductive hypothesis, what do we know? We know that 15 times, say, k equals 2 to the 4n 
minus 1 for some integer k, right? Oops, sorry. I meant to write z there. Sorry about that. Okay, um, oops. Just to be clear also on your, on your letters, divisibility is a relation on the integers. So saying that 15 divides something, of course, in this case, these are all positive, okay? So, I mean, you do already know that k is going to have to be positive. So it's really, in some sense, it's not wrong to say that k is in it. But in general, when we're talking about divisibility, this is something we define on the integers, not just the natural numbers, right? Okay, so, all right, so I want to try to give you a way of thinking about this, okay? And this, this for some of you, some of you are going to get stuck here at this point and say, I'm not really sure what to do next. Here's the way you want to think about it, all right? Somehow, you need to use this inductive hypothesis somewhere. It's going to have to show up somehow. So you need to show that 15 is a factor of this. So what is it that we're going to do? Well, what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to take this, we're going to mess with it a little bit, and we're going to hope that the inductive hypothesis can come into play somehow. And we want to mess with it enough, invoking the inductive hypothesis to get a 15 to pop out. That's the idea. Okay? And that's, that's generally how you're going to do this. If you want to show that 20 divides something, you have your inductive hypothesis and what you need to prove. Take whatever you want 20 to divide and mess with it until you can get a 20 to pop out of the whole thing. That's the strategy. Okay, so this is all that, that um, you have to do. So just simply note this. Two to the four times n plus one minus one equals, and again, remember what our strategy is. We need to show that 15 divides it. So what we want is to be able to, to mess with it to the point where we can pull out a 15 from the entire thing. Okay, well, what's this equal to, first of all? So this is, and by the way, none of this, none of this is actually that hard. You just sort of have to know where you're going here. So this is 2 to the 4n plus 4 minus 1. You all, you all buy that? Okay, and I, again, I really encourage you to follow along here. Okay. You believe that? So, sorry, yeah. 2 to the 4, and all I did was, so I've got 2 to the 4 times n plus 1 minus 1 is 2 to the quantity 4n plus 4, just distributing the 4 through, minus 1, which is 2 to the 4n times 2 to the 4th minus 1. Okay. And do you guys believe this? You guys buy that? 2 to the 4th is 16. So I'm just rewriting this as 16 times 2 to the 4n minus 1. Okay, now here's where, if I don't say anything, you'll just sort of, you might, some of you may be left wondering how you would know to do this. Remember, somehow we're going to, we really need to use this somehow. That 2 to the 4n minus 1 is 15 times something. Well, we don't have 2 to the 4n minus 1 here. We have 16 times it. Okay? We want a 15 to be able to be pulled out of this whole thing. And notice that 16 is really close to 15. Right? <laughs> so this is 15 plus 1 times 2 to the 4n minus 1. Right? That's not, that's not too hard. And so if you distribute this, this is 15 times 2 to the 4n plus 2 to the 4n minus 1. You buy that? You see that? Now, you see why I did that. We need 15s. That's why I did it. We changed the 16 to 15 plus 1 because then we get a 15. And then once we do that, we can, do, we can pull out a 15 here. The only other thing we need is that there's a 15 here. But that's just the inductive hypothesis. And then we're done. Okay. Okay. So, 
Uh, normally, I wouldn't litter this up this way, but um, just so that everybody sees where this is coming from. Is this clear now? You see where I'm getting this? Okay. So let me just recap this in case anyone's uh, lost the, their place. Remember, what we want to do is show that 15 is a factor of this. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, which we have right here, and we're going to hope that a 15 pops out. So this, by distributing the 4, this is just 2 to the 4n plus 4 minus 1. If, you, if you're lost at all, just, just try to follow each of these steps which is equal to 2 to the 4n times 2 to the 4th, because when you have the same base, of course, you have the exponents. You learned that a long time ago. Okay? 2 to the 4th is 16, and we're just going to put that out front like this. So we get that. 16 is 15 plus 1. So we've just changed it this way. And now we're just going to distribute this. 15 times 2 to the 4n, which is this, plus 1 times 2 to the 4n, which is just 2 to the 4n. Then we still have the minus 1 on the outside. And then this becomes 15k by the inductive hypothesis. Right there. And now you can see how this is going to end, right? So we're not quite, technically, we're not quite done yet. Oops. Um, so we still need to show that this is divisible by 15, but that's easy. This is just 15 times 2 to the 4n plus 1. Okay. Oops, sorry, 4k, yeah. Um, plus. Sorry, plus k. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So, what did we just show? Thus, 15 is, in fact, a factor of 2 to the 4 times n plus 1 minus 1. Yes? Because, because 15, okay, 2 to the 4n minus 1 is 15k. Uh -huh. The 16 is only multiplied through by 2 to the 4n. If this was in parentheses, we could have done that. But because the 16 is only multiplied uh, by 2 to the 4n, we can't. We can't do it. Any other, does this make sense? You guys see how this goes? Okay. So that's maybe a little tricky, but you're going to get used to these kinds of things as the class goes on. So now you have one last problem to do. And then we can talk about more of these on Tuesday. Uh, okay. I that one into oh, okay. And I got yeah, yeah, you, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, you can do that too. Um, so yeah, so the other point is that, and it's kind of ha you know six of one half dozen of the other. What she's saying is you just s solve this for two to the four n. Okay, so it's just kind of shuffling it around a different way. Um, so yeah, you could do that too. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so whatever, yeah. Well, okay. I mean, whatever seems more natural, it's going to be different for different people. Um, so I think we're going to run out of time here. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, so, like I said, Tuesday we'll review. We'll do a couple more of these, but try to get some work in on these problems before Tuesday, if you can. We'll talk more about these, and then this is due on Thursday, next Thursday, with uh, your exam. Okay.